Well, greetings out there on YouTube land. Uh, this is a voice from your distant past uh, announcing that we're back and we have a brand new video series for you. Before we get started, uh, there are a few things I'd like to discuss, uh, namely about what has happened since the last video that we posted. Number one, uh, and very sadly, as some of you may know, uh, Rusty uh, the Wonder Dog passed away several months ago very peacefully uh, here in his beloved workshop with his family around him. Uh, we really mourn his passing and uh, miss him every day. Hopefully Jack, his uh, feline nemesis, uh, will rise to the occasion and lend a paw uh, from time to time and help us with our video production. Number three, we took up a new hobby, uh, building old hot rod trucks. And uh, so the workshop now is full of old hot rod trucks, engines, and engine parts, but that doesn't mean there's not room for some amp shenanigans back there on the old workbench. As I've done in the past, uh, I will include some little short snippets of the different trucks I've worked on uh, to kind of break up the monotony in the videos. So without further delay, let's get started on our new video series in which we're going to resurrect an ancient but very interesting amplifier circuit. Recently, while trolling the internet for amplifier pornography, I turned up this site. It's called prewaramps.org and it's maintained by a fellow named Sean who shares my interest in the earliest possible amp. The site features, as you might imagine, uh, pre-war amplifiers, which are among my very favorite of all time. Uh, they're very uncommon, however, uh, and he has quite a collection of them here. Here are the pictures of the fronts of the ones in his collection. And the one of interest right down here is Mystery Amp Number 2. And Sean was kind enough to post a schematic of this amp. Now let's take a look at the schematic and you'll see why I think it's rather unusual and very interesting. Uh, number one, um, it uses some very, very early tubes, 6J7, 6C5. How about an 80 rectifier? That tube only has four pins. It also uses a field coil speaker, which is difficult if you're going to try to build this because field coil speakers are kind of hard to come by. But the feature that I found most endearing about this circuit is the fact that it has two inputs, one into a pentode, a 6J7, and the other into a triode, a 6C5. The circuit is double-ended with a pair of 6V6s uh, for a good probably 15 or 20 watts of output. And uh, we have a 6N7 paraphase phase inverter. Now I'll go into more detail with the circuit in a while and also show you the modifications that I'm going to make uh, that will render it easier to reconstruct and also more reliable and probably sounding better. Now I've posted in the video description a link to this schematic. You can download it and check it out at your leisure, but be aware that the schematic that I'm going to use for my build is uh, going to be modified from this and make it a little simpler and hopefully a whole lot better. Now people have been debating the relative merits of pentodes and triodes for many years. And I thought this circuit was particularly interesting because you can just simply plug in to a pentode preamp or plug in to a triode preamp. No switching or other electronic uh, magic is required. Why is that of interest? Well, let's take a look at how the two different tubes are constructed. Uh, I've already posted a video series on vacuum tubes in which I go into more detail, but let's just have a brief review here to bring us all up to speed. As you probably know, the pent and pentode stands for five because there are five elements within the tube. The plate or anode, a suppressor grid, a screen grid, a control grid, and a cathode. We know that as the electrons leave at a fairly high speed from the cathode and are accelerated toward the very positive plate, 
when they strike the plate, sometimes they will dislodge electrons that are on the plate, creating secondary emission. Uh, the suppressor grid's purpose, which is charged negative because it is connected to the cathode, is to push or repel those electrons back onto the The screen grid is charged highly positive, almost as positive as the plate, and it serves to accelerate and enhance the flow of electrons toward the plate. The screen grid generally has its own B plus power supply, which it, because of a resistor will be a little bit lower than the positive charge that is applied on the plate. And finally, the control grid in which we will insert our music signal. And due to the positive and negative AC fluctuations within the control grid, more or less uh, electrons will flow from the cathode to the plate. So the grid then is going to be like our foot on the accelerator, and it will regulate the electron flow to the plate. The control grid's function is the same in virtually all tubes. Now let's look at the triode, which seems very simple by comparison. Plate, cathode, and in between is a control grid. Nothing fancy. None of these secondary and tertiary grids here to uh, help to accelerate electrons or return electrons to the plate. Now if you're familiar with a tube manual or you've been working with amps for a while, you know that sometimes pentodes are operated in a triode mode. To accomplish this, instead of having the screen grid connected to its own dedicated B plus power supply, we create an external connection between it and the plate of the tube. In so doing, we theoretically eliminate the presence of the screen grid from the tube and uh, leaving us with three tube components here, the plate, the control grid, and the cathode. The suppressor grid connected to the cathode makes it equivalent to the cathode. The screen grid connected to the plate renders it equal to the plate. So there are only three independent structures within the tube. Now some amp manufacturers make this possible by installing a switch in that external connection between the screen grid and the plate. So you can switch it. Closed will be triode mode, open would be pentode mode. But when you start trying to uh, block out parts of the tube, you don't really eliminate their presence. And uh, when we say we operate in triode mode, it's really not exactly the same as a triode, is it? Uh, now that's why I like this amplifier schematic, uh, this circuit, because when we plug in, we will be plugging in directly to either a pentode or a triode preamp tube. So what differences can we expect when we do this? Well, let's compare the performance of pentodes versus triodes. Pentodes have a much higher current output. They are much more efficient. Those extra grids really help the tube function. The result is that pentodes have much higher gain. They have a mu or uh, amplification factor of 1000 or more. Recall that the 12AX7, which is one of the highest performing of all triodes, uh, has a mu of only 100 and most of the 12AX tubes are less than that. Because of this difference, I think you'll see that it's obvious that the pentode is going to have much more gain and therefore much more volume. Uh, it's going to really drive the output tubes. It's going to be a lot cleaner, uh, more headroom than the triode, which is known to be generally softer, warmer, thicker, darker tone, bluesy, less articulate. Pentodes, because of their higher gain, will create more harmonics and more noise. Uh, triodes uh, will produce fewer harmonics and they're a little quieter. This is sort of like humbuckers versus single coils. And finally we're left with two rather esoteric differences between pentodes and triodes. 
The first of these is plate resistance, which is quite high for pentodes, generally greater than 1 million ohms. Triodes have a much lower plate resistance, uh, generally from around 5 to 10,000 ohms. I think you'll see, and it's a little beyond the scope of this discussion, that this is the source of the higher gain in the pentode. The higher gain and the uh, plate resistance are directly related. Now the second rather esoteric difference between pentodes and triodes is grid to plate capacity. I believe most of us know that capacitors consist of two uh, metal plates that are separated uh, by an insulating material. Well look here at a vacuum tube, in this case the pentode, we have one plate here and you could think of the control grid as another metal plate separated by vacuum. Therefore when current flows through the tube it cannot help but behave to some degree like a capacitor. Now with the pentode however we have two other grids here to disrupt that capacitance. These two here inter are interspersed between the grid and plate and therefore will reduce the tube's tendency to be a capacitor compared to a triode which has nothing between the control grid and the plate. The end result is that pentodes have a very low grid to plate capacitance uh, down around 0 0.0005 picofarads. Triodes a much higher plate capacitance around 3.8 picofarads. Now why is this difference in grid to plate capacitance important? Well recall with capacitors, and if you don't recall then check out my video series on capacitors, uh, higher frequencies can pass through capacitors more readily than lower frequencies. And 3.8 picofarads in the triode will create a virtual short circuit between the grid and the plate. Now when you think about this, if you eliminate some of those high frequencies by this uh, short circuit uh, situation, wouldn't you expect a softer, warmer, thicker, darker tone? To my simplistic way of looking at things, that's why the triode behaves the way it does and why the pentode does not. So in conclusion, uh, here is the basic circuit that I'm going to reconstruct. I'm going to build a chassis for this out of aluminum instead of bending the steel like I did with a sledgehammer in the Supro Tremel Verb uh, series. Uh, I think you'll find this type of chassis construction to be very interesting in that you don't need special tools or a 20-pound sledge. Uh, also, we'll be able to see the difference of plugging into uh, a pentode versus a triode preamp. I've enlisted the help of Tommy Foley, who did all the beautiful diagrams for the Tremel Verb series, and he's going to uh, help us out and create the uh, schematic of the modified circuit that I'm going to come up with. All of these circuits, uh, schematics, and everything else will be posted in video descriptions so that you can download them. And if you choose, you can make your very own mystery amp number two. Well, that's about it for this part one video in the mystery amp number two uh, construction series. I just want you to know how dedicated I am to this project in that I've already ordered the parts. I ordered uh, all th uh, the two transformers and uh, filter choke from Triode Electronics at 122.27. I've ordered the tubes and other components, capacitors, resistors, uh, tube sockets, and all from Antique Electronics Supply at a total of 71.49. So as it stands, I'm into this at a little less than $200. Hopefully it all won't end up in a dumpster uh, and with me guzzling booze and laying face down in the gutter nearby. So if this uh, lurid undertaking appeals to you in any way, please stay tuned for video number two uh, in which uh, we'll have Jack perform a CAT scan on the incoming parts uh, and we'll start to lay out our chassis and construct an aluminum chassis that does not require the bending of aluminum, which trust me is no fun at all. 
Okay, well, that's about it. Uh, thanks for watching. It's great to be back, and I hope to see you again soon. Bye for now. Okay, Jack, the endless nap is over. We started a new video series. There's CAT scans to be done. And, well, okay, maybe a little later.